So again, as we uh, are approaching the end of our Torah reading cycle, we're on Nitzabim, and that uh, goes from Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 10, through uh, chapter 30, verse 20. So half of 29, all of verse 30, or chapter 30. And our Haftorah portion is uh, Isaiah 61, 10 through 63, 9. So <clears throat> just as a way of explanation for uh, those who are new, uh, the reason we do, uh, we read these Torah portions, why we uh, study the Torah uh, is, w it's our understanding, and I think scriptures will bear this out, is that um, the Torah is the, uh, the very foundation of all of our understanding. Uh, all of the prophets taught from the Torah. All of the New Testament or the, uh, in the second writings, Yahshua, the apostles, Shaul, all of them taught from the prophets and the writings. So in order to even understand what Yahshua was talking about or any of the gospels or anything Shaul has to say, we have to understand the Torah because that's the foundation of where they taught from. So, <clears throat> so that's the point, that's the purpose of why we start our Torah reading cycle after we return from the feast. When we come back from the feast at the end of October, we'll start again in Bereshit and we'll go through all of the Torah portions again. And... Uh, and try to glean things out of them to really uh, help us improve our walk. The whole idea really is to, to, uh, to, to walk a more obedient and a more, uh, uh, a more perfect walk than we had before. So that's the reason we're going through the Torah, the reason we, we, uh, <coughs> we study the Torah, and uh, it's... It, uh, it's for our uh, edification. So we're, we're on portion Nitzabim. So we have three more to go with two more Sabbaths. So we'll, uh, we're gonna double up next time. We'll do uh, <clears throat> those, uh, the portions we'll do next week will be Wa'elet and Ha'azim, Hatzinu, and then we'll do the last portion the, right before we leave for the feast. Um, so we've been doing this a couple of years now. Um, those of you that have been with us through the, through the you know, through uh, before last, last feast, you've been through a whole cycle, you know, uh, but we've recorded most of these. We don't have every single one of them that we've done recorded, but on our YouTube channel, We've got, um, I think last count, there was something like 174 different videos of Torah portions. Yes. It's on. Yeah. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> each time we go through a Torah portion, what we try to do is teach on something different. We try to glean a different topic from each of the portions. So today, um, as we always do, we'll go through and uh, sort of just uh, summarize the portion. We'll kind of just talk about uh, the high points as we start in uh, chapter 29, uh, verse 10. Moshe uh, has the Israelites renew the covenant just prior to his death. This is, Deuteronomy is written uh, right before Moshe dies. And it really sort of summarizes and brings out, you know, all of the teachings of, you know, the other four books. And <clears throat> there's a few places where it's expounding on some things. He reiterates some ideas. But uh, Devarim, the words, um, is the, uh, the book that actually goes into the, the Ark of the Covenant. So Moshe has the Israelites, all the nation, the entire nation, before they go into the promised land, renew the covenant just prior to his death. Uh, then Moshe prophesies that Israel will eventually fall into idolatry, which, you know, of course happened. It did, they did. 
And uh, Moshe then in chapter 30 prophesies Israel's in, uh, eventual repentance and redemption and coming back into the land. Um, and further on in chapter 30 and verse 11, uh, we, uh, we see that Moshe talks about, um, he basically counters this argument that it's too hard to keep the Torah. In uh, chapter 30, verse 11, something we touched on last week, it says, This command which I am commanding you today is not too hard for you, nor is it too far off. So some of our friends in the Christian uh, thinking think, well, because it's impossible to keep the law perfectly as Yahshua did, he did it for us. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to do any obedience. And Moshe is certainly just pointing out here, you know, that's not the case at all. He says in verse 12, it's not in the heavens to say who shall ascend into the heavens for us and bring it to us and cause us to hear it so that we do it, nor is it beyond the sea to say who shall go over the sea for us and bring it to us and cause us to hear it so that we do it. For the word is very near you, okay? The word is very near you. Most of us, unlike Israel in the, uh, you know, whatever century that was, say, you know, the 14th century BC, they didn't have you know, all of these scriptures in front of them in their house on their bookshelf that they could, you know, read every day like we do. Um, we have that. The word is very near us in our mouth and in our heart to do it. Additionally, Yahshua, Yahshua became, Yahshua was the word and, and, uh, and came and dwelt among us and pitched his tent among us. So we have... Yahshua and Yahweh's Holy Spirit living in us, Yahweh's word living in us, and uh, uh, for us to do it. So there's action required. Yahweh just doesn't expect us to sit back and wait and say, okay, you know, I believe, I'm saved, I'm, and it just doesn't work like that. He, it's an action that Yahweh's looking for from us. So in this portion, Nisabim, something kind of remarkable happens, and it kind of can happen even without our noticing it, is it changed the very terms of all believers' existence, and has really sort of life-changing implications for all of us. Moshe renewed the covenant, and it, although this may not sound dramatic, it was. It was dramatic, and we'll look at this here in, uh, as we, we go through this. He said, we'll pick this up in verse 10 of Deuteronomy 29 as uh, Moshe is, uh, is renewing the covenant. Uh, the first beginning of uh, Nitzabim means you are standing and verse 10 starts with all of you are standing today before Yahweh your Elohim your leaders, your tribes, your elders, your officers, the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, your sojourner who is in the midst of your camp from the one who cuts your wood as the one who draws your water so that you should enter into a covenant with Yahweh your Elohim and into his oath which Yahweh your Elohim makes with you today in order, this is why he's doing this, in order to establish you today as a people for himself and he himself be your Elohim as he has spoken to you, as he has sworn to your fathers, Abraham, Yitzhak, and to Yaakov, and not with you alone, I am making this covenant and this oath, but with him who stands here with us today before Yahweh our Elohim, as well as him who is not here with us today. So we weren't there. You know, that was 3,500 years before we were born. But Yahweh is speaking to us through this covenant and, and wants us to be part of this covenant. So, um, so thus far in the history of of humanity as you know as recorded in the Torah Yahweh has made three covenants 
so far. And the first we're going to look at is with uh, Genesis in Genesis chapter 9. And in Genesis chapter 9, this is the covenant he makes, not just with Noah, but with all of humanity, really. We'll pick this up in, in, uh, in verse 9. Chapter 9, verse 9. And I, see, I establish my covenant, my agreement, my promise with you and with your seed after you and with every living being that is with you, the birds, the cattle, the beasts of the earth, with you and of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. And I shall establish my covenant with you and never again is all flesh cut off by the waters of a flood and never again is there a flood to destroy the earth. And Elohim said, this is a sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living being that is with you for all generations to come. And I shall set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Everything, every living being that exists on the earth, human beings, the animals, the birds, the beasts of the field, every, everything is included in this covenant. And he says, and it shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud, and I shall remember covenant which is between me and you and every living being of all flesh and never again let the waters become a flood to destroy all flesh and the rainbow shall be in the cloud and I shall see it to remember the everlasting covenant between Elohim and every living being of all flesh that is on the earth and Elohim said to Noah this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. So, <clears throat> as we see here with, uh, with uh, this covenant, this rainbow, you know, it's no mystery, it's no big uh, surprise that the enemy would use this sign of the first covenant Yahweh made as sort of a symbol of, of, uh, of all opposition to everything Yahweh stands for. He's, the enemy is not a, a, uh, a very much an original thinker, you know. He's got to counterfeit everything. And that's one of the things he, he uses here to counterfeit what Yahweh, uh, this, this symbol that Yahweh gave to us, to, not only to all human beings, all humanity, but all the animals, every, every living creature. He gave this, uh, this uh, symbol of this, uh, this rainbow as a uh, reminder, as a, as a sign of the covenant that he'll never destroy the earth again with a flood. So the second uh, covenant, um, and you'll see as we go through these, they're, how they're a little different from the one before. The second uh, covenant that Yahweh makes was with Abraham and Abraham's descendants. Let's go over to Genesis chapter 17. So Genesis chapter 17, we'll pick this up in verse 1, where he says, And it came to be when Abram was 99 years old, that Yahweh appeared to Abram and said to him, I am El Shaddai. Walk before me and be perfect. El Shaddai. I am El Mighty One of Mighty Ones. I am the Mighty One. And and I give my covenant between me and you and shall greatly increase you. And Abraham, Abraham, Abram fell on his face and Elohim spoke to him saying, As for me, look, my covenant is with you and you shall become a father of many nations. And no longer is your name called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham 
because I shall make you a father of many nations, and I shall make you exceedingly fruitful, and make nations of you, and sovereigns shall come from you. I shall establish my covenant between me and you, and your seed after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be Elohim to you and to your seed after you. <clears throat> Continuing on here in, in, uh, in verse 8, where he says, And I shall give to you and your seed after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I shall be their Elohim. And Elohim said to Abraham, As far as you, guard my covenant you and your seed after you throughout your generations. This is my covenant which you guard between me and you and your seed after you. Every male child among you is to be circumcised, and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. And a son of eight days is circumcised by you, every male child in your generations. He who is born in your house or bought with silver of any foreigner, not of your seed. And he who is born in your house, and he who is bought with your silver, has to be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, as an everlasting covenant. For an uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, his life shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So, that made Abraham, this covenant made Abraham the father of the faith that would not be the faith of all humanity yet. It will be in the future. Right now it's not. But would strive to be a blessing to all humanity. And he says, through you all the families of the earth will be blessed. We see that in Genesis chapter 22, verse 18, where he says, In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham's descendant, Yahshua, would in fact be the one through whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed. So the third, uh, the third covenant was uh, with Israel, part of Abraham's descendants. In the days of Moshe, when the people stood at Mount Sinai, heard the Ten Commandments, and accepted the terms of their destiny as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. We see this in, in uh, Exodus chapter 19. We, you know, taught on this topic, you know, many, many times. But uh, we see here in, in chapter 19 uh, and verse 5, And now, if you diligently obey my voice and shall guard my covenant, then you shall be my treasured possession above all the peoples, for the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a reign or a kingdom of priests and a set-apart nation. Those are the words which you are to speak to the children of Israel. <clears throat> so, so what we want to kind of the the where we're going to take those covenants though the differences between this is um, who initiated these three covenants? Okay, it wasn't Noah that came to Yahweh. It wasn't Abraham that came to Yahweh and said, "Hey, I want to make an agreement with you. I want you to do something here. I want to." come up with an agreement. It was Yahweh that, that uh, initiated the process. It, was, it wasn't Noah, it wasn't Abraham, it wasn't Moshe, um, or the Israelites who sought a covenant with Yahweh. It was Yahweh who sought a covenant with humanity, right? There is, although a discernible change as we trace the trajectories, we kind of look at how these covenants over time uh, and these three events, this, the, the sort of trajectory of those. From Noah, Yahweh asked for no specific response. You know, he didn't ask anything of Noah. He just said, this is what I'm doing. 
for everybody, not only you and your descendants, but all of the earth, right? And he didn't ask for a specific response. There was nothing that Noah had to do to show that he accepted the terms of the covenant. So, you know, you, you might have heard of these Noah, Noahide laws, you know, the seven laws that, uh, that Jewish tradition would say, you know, was, came out of this. Um, they're not in scripture other than a couple of these are in, uh, in, uh, in the commandments here. But what we don't want to think is Yahweh uh, made separate sets of laws for, uh, for some people and not for others. <clears throat> As that Jewish tradition, you know, puts forth that idea. Um, so throughout the process, Noah really was, was passive. Um, you know, he didn't do anything to initiate the covenant. He didn't do anything to accept the covenant. He just was, was part of that, of all of everything being blessed by that covenant. So the Abraham, things are a little different. Abraham, uh, Yahweh did ask for a response. And it's sort of a painful one. The Hebrew word for circumcision is milah, and to this day we call it a brit milah, you know, when a, when a child, a, a male child, is circumcised on the eighth day. So, you know, uh, he did ask something of, of Abraham, and it's something, you know, sort of demanding an initiation ceremony. Let's go to, uh, back to uh, chapter 17 of Genesis where um, in initiating this covenant with with uh, with Abraham he talks about that um, there would be a sign of this covenant and it would be in the flesh of the men of the uh, that uh, were part of this covenant. Not the men, only the, uh, not the women, only the men. So it goes from uh, chant, uh, verse 10 through verse 14. You can read that. We just read it a, a little while ago. But it's commands that a child be circumcised on the eighth day. So what does that have to do with us? Are we, you know, we're, we're not going to get into a, 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 a teaching specifically about uh, circumcision. This is about this initiation ceremony, this acceptance of the covenant. So just as Shaul was falsely accused of teaching that circumcision was done away with, we're not going to go down that road right now, but we're going to talk about an initiation ceremony. Okay. Let's see what Shaul has to say about this. Let's go over to Romans chapter 2. And we're going to pick this up in verse 28. Um, all of chapter 2 is talking a lot about Again, let me just go back a little bit and just say about the book of Romans. So the, Roman, the book of Romans is written by Shaul to the congregation of believers settled in Rome. And it mostly consists of Jewish sort of people that have been raised Jewish, have been raised their whole life Torah observant. Although there are some, at the end we'll, we'll see there are some, uh, some uh, people who are not, who are sort of grafted in. But these are people, he's speaking primarily to Jews. And he's speaking to them about how all the things you knew that you came to understand with Torah, what, how, do we, how do we reconcile all this stuff with Yahshua now? How does this make sense? What are, what's... How are we going forward? You know, 
are we talking about, uh, you know, some Jewish people are saying you have to do this, you have to do that, um, and uh, you can't do this and you can't do that. And um, some people or some Gentile people are saying all of this is done away with. And we're going to see Shaul who learned directly from Yahshua. He was taught directly by Yahshua, you know, in the spirit. He was taken into to Arabia and taught for three years by Yahshua personally. And this is all inspired writing. This is the words inspired uh, by Yahshua and Yahweh to Shaul. So as he's talking here about circumcision, things can be kind of confusing a little bit if you take some of this out of context. Um, and he's talking about primarily the theme of Romans and the theme of, of um, especially in chapter 2, is that, um, as we've taught before, that you know the Jewish sort of ditch of the way, you know, kind of leads people to think all you have to do, if you just follow these rules, you will be saved. You can earn your salvation by your works, right? And Shaul is, is uh, refuting that idea of mainstream sort of, of uh, pharisaical Judaism. You know, that was being taught at the time of Yahshua, at the time, really the first century, really from the time of, of uh, the return from Babylon, from the exile. This system of, you know, rabbis and, and, uh, and the 613 commandments and all this stuff came into, uh, into uh, the understanding of pharisaical Judaism that, you know, obedience is what saves you. Right? That's the whole concept of, oh, let's build a fence around the law, right? We can, you know, not uh, violate the third commandment, don't keep, take Yahweh's name in vain, if we don't ever say it, right? We just don't say that, that name. Well, that's a fence around the law. That's not a, at all what the, what the commandment was talking about. But that's the, the thinking of Pharisaical Judaism is, you know, stay away from negative commands and just jump both feet into positive commands of these 613 commandments. And one of those, of course, is circumcision. And so Shaul is pointing out here, if you, uh, as, a, as a believing Jew, as a believer, um, rest your salvation on the fact, well, I'm circumcised, you know, I'm, I'm okay. And what Shaul is talking about here is not so fast. There's more to it than that. You know, we're deepening your understanding now. It's more than just, you know, this mark in your flesh. There's more to it than that. And what about women? You know, how, how does that include in this? So what Shaul here is talking about, let's, uh, let's pick this up in verse 23. It says, you who make your boast in the Torah, though uh, through the transgression of the Torah, do you disrespect Elohim? For the name of Elohim is blasphemed among the nations because of you. You know, that's, he's not making that up. He's teaching from the prophets, from Yeshayahu. He's taken that from Yeshayahu 52, right? And he says, for circumcision and deeds profits, profits you if you practice the Torah. But if you're a transgressor of the Torah, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So, you know, are any of us not transgressors of the Torah? No, of course not. We all transgress the Torah, right? So even though if we, you know, have this mark in our flesh, we're... It, it says it's, it, it becomes uncircumcision. So if an uncircumcised one watches over the, the righteousness of the Torah, shall not his uncircumcision be reckoned, uh, be reckoned as circumcision? So you see where he's going with this? 
the point is um, that particular thing that happened to you when you're eight days old, okay, and you really had nothing to do with it, is not saving you. It doesn't help. What we're talking about is obedience to the Torah. And if the uncircumcised by nature who perfects the Torah shall judge you, notwithstanding letter and circumcision, are a transgressor of the Torah. For he is not a Jew or a Yahudi outwardly, who is so outwardly, neither is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But a, a Jew, a Yahudi, is one, is he who is so inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not literally, whose praise is not from men, but from Elohim. <coughs> So this kind of stuff is what gets Paul in trouble, right? People are saying, and he doesn't say this at all. He doesn't say, don't circumcise your children. He, doesn't, he never says that. But he's accused of that later on. We read that in Acts, you know, where he defends himself before the authorities and says, I believe everything that's written in the Torah and the prophets, you know, and I've been doing it my whole life. I haven't ever taught against that. But what he's trying to do is take this concept that uh, of, of really circumcision and, and what it really means to Elohim. And did he come up with this idea on his own? Is this something he made up? You know, circumcision is that of the heart. No. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 10. <clears throat> this idea was around all the time, always from the very beginning. That wasn't what... Yahweh was always after was, you know, this, this painful experience <clears throat> and only in men, right? Let's go to chapter 10 of Deuteronomy and we'll pick this up in verse 12. <clears throat> <clears throat> Very important. And now, Yisrael, what is Yahweh or Elohim asking of you? But to fear Yahweh your Elohim, to walk in all his ways, and to love him and serve Yahweh your Elohim with all of your heart and with all of your being, and to guard the commands of Yahweh and his laws, which I command you today for your good. <clears throat> Am I in the right place? Yep. Um, C. And this is really the same thing he said in, in the Shema, right? In Deuteronomy 6, 4, right? He said the same thing. I want your whole heart. I want every part of your being. That's what I'm looking for. Pick this up in, we're in verse 14 now. See the heavens and the heaven of heavens belong to Yahweh or Elohim, also the earth and all that is in it. Yahweh delighted only in your fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, you above all peoples as it is today. And you shall circumcise the foreskin of your heart and harden your neck no more. This concept of circumcising your heart, that's men and women. All of us. That's really what Yahweh is looking for. He's looking for a circumcised heart. What does that mean? Is to, is to take away, you know, the hardness, the outer protection of that. He wants our hearts. He wants us to be uh, completely his. We also see that in this very Torah portion here in, in Deuteronomy chapter 30. He says the same thing. We'll pick this up. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 6. And he says, Yahweh, your Elohim, shall circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed to love Yahweh, your Elohim, with all your heart and with all your being so that you might live. And Yahweh, your Elohim, shall put all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you, who persecuted you. So this idea that, that Shaul was, you know, doing away with physical circumcision, no such thing. He never says that. 
You know, he never says don't circumcise children. You know, as just an aside, you know, we find out here in the 21st century, 20th century, that, uh, oh, remarkably, when a new child is born, a male child, uh, when a child is born, the vitamin K level, which is what causes blood to coagulate, is strongest on the eighth day. Happens the eighth day, that's the, the strongest. Is that a coincidence? No, I don't think so. So, you know, the point is here, we're not going into an in-depth stu study on circumcision, but we want to understand the concept of our agreement with Yahweh's covenant. So we do that at baptism, immersion into Yahshua's name, right? So a lot of people think that they're baptized. They think they been, you know, they've been sprinkled or, you know, even if they're dunked, they're Father, Son, Holy Ghost, that kind of thing, you know, that's, that's not a, a proper immersion. We, we're talking about immersion in Yahshua's name uh, and then receiving Yahweh's Holy Spirit by having hands laid on them by a qualified ordained elder. And Yash, uh, Shaul explains this initiation ceremony, you know, that uh, <clears throat> is, is very important to the covenant. Let's go to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians uh, chapter 2. So you can see some of the things that we're reading here. It's very easy to take one or two um, sort of verses together and maybe make a doctrine out of that. Which is something we never want to do. We want to take all of Yahweh's word together and understand true, proper doctrine. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 2. And we're going to pick this up in verse 11. It says, In him you were circumcised with a circumcision not made with hands in the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Messiah. So how does that, how does that happen? Verse 12 having been buried with him in immersion, in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through belief in the, in the working of Elohim who raised him from the dead. He further explains this in Romans chapter 6. Let's go over to Romans. And again, who's he talking to in Romans? He's talking to primarily people, Jewish believers who have been their whole life been Torah observant and now are starting to understand what all these, what the, the Torah and the prophets were talking about that was always pointing towards what Yahshua would do in the future. Let's go to chapter 6 of Romans. This is a, a this whole chapter 6 is really talking about immersion and baptism and how important that is and how really we cannot be saved without this. We cannot receive eternal life without this initiation into this covenant with Yahweh. Chapter 6 of Romans, we'll pick this up in verse 3. It says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were immersed into Messiah Yahshua we're immersed into his death. Same thing that Colossians was talking about, being buried in baptism. We were therefore buried with him through immersion into death. That Messiah was raised from the dead by the esteem of the Father, so also we should walk in newness of life. For we have come to be grown together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be of the resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was impaled, was put to death. Our old self was put to death and buried in the waters of baptism, 
that old person is gone. He's dead, he's buried, and the new person that comes up out of the water is a new creation, is a new, uh, a new person. So that the body of sin might be rendered powerless to serve sin no longer. For he who has died has been made right from sin. And if we died with Messiah, we believe that she, we shall also live with him. So you see how, how critical this is to, to our, us receiving eternal life. We have to be back, uh, immersed. We have to agree to this, same as you know, Israel did at Mount Sinai. There was actually three times, you know, I, Yahweh asked them, are you sure you want to do this? We'll get into that in a minute. But, uh, <clears throat> but immersion is very, very uh, important. It's, it's critical. It's, it, we have to uh, have this done as we accept, we agree to Yahweh's covenant and agree that the old man that we once were before we uh, went through immersion that was you know, full of sin and, and, and is buried, is done with, is gone away, and there's a new person, a new creation that comes up out of that water and receives Yahweh's Holy Spirit when we come back and lay hands on that, on that, uh, on that new creation and lay hands on them and as they receive Yahweh's Holy Spirit. You cannot rec receive eternal life without this happening to you. <clears throat> so Shaul is talking about a public acknowledgement of our commitment to Yahweh, just as Israel said so at Mount Sinai. We see that in Exodus, in one place, Exodus 19.8. You know, all the people answered together and said, all that Yahweh has spoken, we shall do. So Moshe brought back the words of the people to Yahweh. So Yahweh didn't, uh, didn't uh, enter into this covenant without first asking the people, are you sure you want to do this? So from the Israelites at Sinai, Yahweh asked much more. He asked them in effect to recognize him as their sole sovereign and legislator. The Sinai covenant came with, uh, came with all of the Torah. <clears throat> Israel was to incorporate Yahweh's way of life into every aspect of their lives. So as these covenants proceed, Yahweh asks more and more of his partners, uh, those who are part of the covenant with him, right? Uh, or to put it differently, he entrusts them with ever greater responsibilities. So something else happened at Sinai that had not happened before. Yahweh tells Moshe to announce the nature of the covenant before he was making it and to see whether the people would agree. And he did that actually no less than three times. And the people answered as one, saying, All that Yahweh has spoken, we will do. And the people responded with a single voice in Exodus 24, verse 3. He says, All we will do everything Yahweh has spoken. And in verse 7, the people said, All that Yahweh has spoken, we will do and heed. So, you know, he, he had them say that, uh, you know, agree to this before the covenant was actually um, was actually uh, entered into, and it's the same with us with baptism. You know, we don't get a covenant first, and then you know we'll say, "Well, we'll try this out for a while and see how this works." You know, we'll see if I get blessed or how. You know, what's going to happen? No, that's not how it works. You know, he asked for our agreement. And if you agree and, uh, and, and uh, agree to be baptized and agree to accept Yahweh's Holy Spirit, then the covenant is, is, uh, is entered into. You know, so this is sort of the first time in history, recorded history, and, you know, no other religious sort of uh, 
system or anything has this idea. Um, this is the first time in history that we encounter the concept that's also enshrined in the American Declaration of Independence, namely the consent of the governed, right? It says that in, you know, the, uh, the Founding Fathers mentioned that in their Declaration of Independence, but it's a concept that had been there from the very beginning from Yahweh. He doesn't rule over people that won't, you know, doesn't enter into a covenant with people that don't agree to it. So Yahweh only spoke the Ten Commandments after the people signaled that they had given their consent to be bound by his word. Yahweh does not impose his rule by force. At Sinai, covenant making became mutual. Both sides had to agree. Now, in the future, when Yahshua returns, it's going to be a little bit different circumstances. There won't be uh, the consent of the governed. Everybody is going to be part of Yahweh's kingdom and those that refuse will will try to bring them along but if they don't you know their end will be of course the lake of fire Yahweh will not have anyone in his kingdom that that uh, it will not be ruled over <coughs> So the human role in covenant making, you know, grows greater over time. And, uh, but Nitzavim, this, this, uh, this uh, parasha, takes this one step further. further. Moshe, in Deuteronomy chapter 29, uh, of his own initiative, but really sort of inspired by Yahweh, renewed that covenant before they went into the promised land. And again, that's in chapter 29 that we read earlier, um, 10 through 13, you know, as we uh, begin this Torah portion. So this was the first time that the covenant was re renewed, but it wasn't the last time. Um, it happened again. There's several other instances. We're not going to turn to each one of these as for the sake of time, but you can write these down if you want to. At the end of Joshua's life, Joshua the son of Nun, right? At the end of his life, he also renewed the covenant in Joshua chapter 24. Later in the days of uh, Yehoiada, uh, we see in, in 2 Kings 11:17, uh, the king renewing the covenant. What? Oh, uh, Yehoiada is that king and uh, his Kayahu or Hezekiah also does it again in chapter 29 of Second Chronicles so you can read that Josiah also renewed the covenant in 1st Kings 23 uh, and also Second Chronicles chapter 34 after the exile after they returned from Babylon Nehemiah and Ezra also renewed the covenant. Nehemiah chapter 8. You know, we've been through this a couple of times before. Remember how, you know, they're, they're uh, uh, first under, now understanding that, the, you know, of keeping the, the feast of the seventh month, the Moedim, right? And all the people are standing there before them. And Ezra reads the Torah to them. <clears throat> But it happened first in, you know, this parasha that we have today, that we're going through today. It happened because Moshe knew that it had to happen. In terms of our history, uh, we're, we're about to shift from divine initiative of Yahweh initiating things to the human initiative. And this is what Moshe was preparing Israelites for in the last month of his life, before he would go up to Mount Nebo, be able to see the promised land, he was not allowed to enter, and that he would die there. Uh, it's as if he had said, until now, Yahweh has led, you know, in a pillar of cloud and fire, and you followed. Now Yahweh is handing over the reins of history to you, to Israel, right? And by extension to us. 
<clears throat> but from here on, you must lead. If your hearts are with Yahweh, he will be with you. But you are no longer children. You're adults. And as adults has parents, uh, as a child does, but his or her relationship with them is different. An adult knows the burden of responsibility. An adult does not wait for someone else to take the first step. And that's the significance, this epic significance of this portion, Nitzavim. The parasha that stands almost at the end of the Torah and that we read at the end of the cycle of readings. It's about getting ready for a new beginning um, in which we act for Yahweh instead of waiting for Yahweh to act for us. So we translate this sort of in, so we put this in human terms. How does that apply to our walk now? How do we really think about this in, in incorporating into our walk? If, you, if you, you think about this in human terms and apply it to your walk on the way, you'll see that how life-changing it can be. So, for example, maybe you're feeling like, um, like you're not getting the kind of encouragement you think you ought to, ought to be getting from other believers or from elders or leaders or something like that. And you're working hard, but uh, you're not really feeling like you're making any progress. And you need support at meet, uh, moments like this because taking risks and suffering uh, inevitable criticism that we all get as we're, you know, walking this way of, you know, having to ask off from work on the Sabbath, having to, you know, um, why, why won't you do something on the Sabbath, those kinds of things. Um, we all face those kinds of inevitable criticism and it can be emotionally draining. But, you know, maybe encouragement doesn't come. So what if we turn that around? What if instead of waiting to be encouraged, we look for somebody else who needs encouragement? What if I did for someone else that I was hoping someone would do for me? That can be life-changing. It can give you strength like you've never had before. So we can begin to formulate this sort of as an ethic in, in our life, a, you know, sort of a, a, uh, a, a way we think. We don't wait to be praised. We praise others. We don't wait to be respected. We respect others. We don't stand on the sidelines criticizing others. Do something yourself to make things better. Don't wait for the world to change. Bring the, the, begin the process yourself and then win others to that process. You know, you've probably seen Facebook memes that have this saying, uh, be the change that you seek in the world. And that's kind of what Nitzabim is really talking about, is, is taking the initiative, taking it on ourselves to... Uh, to uh, do this, not just, you know, like in the first covenant, it just sort of happened. We didn't have to do anything. There was nothing to it. As we get to the covenant at Sinai, now there's something we have to participate in. We have to agree to this. So that's what Moshe was doing in the last month of his life. In that long series, as we see in Devarim, really Devarim consists of this long series of public sort of instruction and addresses that he, he, uh, he, uh, he speaks to Israel, uh, <coughs> culminating in this great covenant renewal ceremony that we see in today's parasha. Devarim Deuteronomy marks the end of the childhood of Israel. From there on, Israel became, comes uh, became Yahweh's call to human responsibility for us. Faith is not, want, uh, not waiting for Yahweh. Faith is a realization that Yahweh is waiting for us to act. Hence, that brings us to this life-changing idea. Whenever you find yourself distressed because someone hasn't done for you what, they think, what you think they should have done, Turn that thought around 
and then do it for them. Don't worf, wait for the world to get better. Take the initiative yourself. The world is waiting for you. So I hope uh, this has been a blessing to you. Um, we'll end the teaching there and say...